And we're back with episode 20 of the QGIS Road to Nirvana series. Today I'm joined, oh, I forgot to put your name on, Amy, I hope, I hope you don't mind. Uh, today I'm joined That's with, right. <laughs> with Amy Burness, our intern at Cartosa. And we're going to be looking at some work I've been doing uh, with QGIS Server, QGIS Desktop, QGIS Atlas, um, and um, yeah, some clever magic to to make uh, those things all kind of work together nicely. So I'll start off by showing you what I made and then I'm just gonna, I'm not gonna go through the whole process of making it from scratch. I'm just gonna dip into some interesting parts of QGIS and, uh, to show you how I kind of put things together. So this is the website I've been developing for my, my small holding and um, it kind of, uh, it's got a bunch of interesting features which I'll dig into in separate sessions but the thing i want to focus on right now is what happens when you click on a camp uh, let's click on my veggie garden here and uh, you see that you get the get feature info request um, uh, and the images that we've got displaying here have been collected using input the field data collection tool by lutra consulting um, and these images are kind of like automatically brought in. So when you when you work on the mobile, um, I've got the whole syncing system to bring it over to the to the web server. And so um, when you click on a thing, you can see the pictures that you took in the field. Again, I'll dig into that in a separate time. What I want to do focus in uh, is on this part here, where what I've done is I've made a report dynamically for um, for the camp that I've clicked on um, using QGIS Atlas. So. I'm just going to show you the result now. This red uh, cross is just because I haven't taken a picture for spring yet. I need to put a better uh, placeholder image for when, when there's no picture. And the report itself is not beautiful yet. It's really just to show the the concept. I'll be adding, you know, adding um, updates to it to make it look pretty as well. But what the report does is basically shows you the name of the camp that um, you clicked on. If there were notes for the camp, it would show them here, and I'll put other things about it, like the size and so on here later. And then it shows the the picture series from the different seasons of the camp. Um, it shows the overview of the small holding here with the, the highlighted camp there, and then the camp itself is shown on the map uh, with the highlighted color around it. Um, and so, yeah, and then we can go to any any camp in that same way and click on it and get a report which is unique to that camp and this report is being generated on the fly so if I change any data and click on that again I'll get the, the new version with the new new cartography or whatever new um, new features showing on it right so I wanted to just show um, really how I got this to, to work uh, in in my web application and I'm using a plugin by Etienne Trimail from from Lizmap. Uh, just gonna go here to Qgis uh, Atlas. Uh, uh, it's this one over here. So it's uh, it's a plugin which basically exposes the Qgis Atlas feature to um, to Qgis Server. And if you don't know what the Qgis Atlas feature does is it basically allows you to produce a map series for um, a layer in your project. So um, I'll just pull up the, the layout. So here I've got a layout which um, I've created. It's exactly the same one we were just looking at in the on, in the web browser. Um, and the layout is bound um, by this Atlas feature to a specific layer. And when Atlas is enabled, you can enable and disable it here. Um, you can flip through the, the different camps in this case, and it will do some Atlas specific things. For example, I've set it to highlight in red the, the selected feature. It's got the overview that zooms to the Atlas feature, um, and it will show the details of that particular feature. And with Atlas, you can export this to a PDF like this. Um, and it will render every feature on the Atlas layer out into a single page or however you've, this, however you've set it up uh, into that report. 
uh, and you'll get one big report or you can also make a series of images if you want to um, so uh, like one one per camp for example one image per camp so let's just let that finish rendering quickly so here's what it made over here and um, you can see that it's made one page per camp which is pretty cool right so what we wanted to do is hook into this atlas and um, ask for a specific page from the atlas when you've clicked on the feature um, in QGIS. So I'm going to, like I said, just show you some particular things that I did to enable all that to happen. The first thing I did was in the camps um, layer, I went and I went to the field list here and I created a virtual field. So a virtual field is one that's not actually stored on disk or in the database or wherever. It's calculated on the fly. And um, what I put in this virtual field is an expression that um, basically constructs a URL. And the URL construction is based on Etienne's uh, documentation here. So there's a uh, readme here that explains it basically explains that you need to use the Atlas service for your request and um, that you need to provide this filter and the filter, if you wanted to ID, uh, f filter by a feature ID, then you need to like construct it in this way. So I really just took his documentation here and went and constructed a URL in the same way and wrapped it in an HTML ahref, which is a, a hyperlink and told it here to pop it up in a new tab, gave it some text to show, and then put the, uh, the ID of the current feature into the, into the generated string so that you can see, well, you can't see so well there, but if we go back to the uh, attribute table for that, you can see that it will generate, you know, for each feature, it will put the number of the feature basically into into that generated URL. So that's pretty nice because when you um, make uh, a get feature info request, which is a, the QGIS web service um, WMS uh, supported feature, then uh, you can it will give you back all of these attributes that we're showing here, I except that I've gone and filtered them a bit to say whether they should be shown in the WMS request or not. So you'll see here, I've asked not to expose certain of these things uh, to the WMS uh, feature request. Okay, and that just keeps my um, my query results clean here. So when I when I show this here, anything that's not uh, that's been disabled in that list will not show in my little table that I generate here. So any uh, any questions so far, Amy? Does that make sense, what I did? That all totally makes sense. Um, the only question, and it might be kind of a little bit off base, but when you open the report, um, and I know it's quite simple right now and you are going to fancy it up a bit, mm -hmm. but um, when you open the report, it doesn't have a legend for the map, so I don't know what anything is if I've just opened the report. Sure. Do you okay, add I'm a legend gonna, to that Yeah, page? you can add a legend and you can, uh, like I said, I, um, this is just really um, a proof of concept, but you can add a legend mm -hmm. in normal kind of stuff here and you can, uh, you know, customize the legend however you want. Uh, mm. Using the normal legend things and if you've using legend filtering, uh, where you can say uh, find the option quickly um, only shows items inside the linked map uh, or you can say only show items inside the current atlas feature if you wanted to so then it will kind of like shrink the list of things in the legend down to only only <clears throat> the types of features that are actually found inside of this area um, Cool. So yeah, so you can add all that. You can basically do anything that you do in a normal layout. The only difference is that it will generate uh, one one of these documents per feature. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, cool. And then the other the the bits of magic that I also did for, to make these the highlights um, work. So you can see when I click on. Let me just go back to here. Um, 
and I click on here, you can see that that got highlighted, was just to add a little um, expression uh, for this outline fill that I put in here. And I just, there's various ways you could approach it, but what I did was I just uh, created an expression which just said, if this feature ID, the one that is busy drawing, is not the same as the current feature, the Atlas feature ID, the one that the Atlas is trying to draw, then set the line width to zero, otherwise set it to three. And so that what that means is that on the map, it will there'll be only ever one polygon, which has got a thick red um, second symbol layer showing, and the rest will all be not showing because they'll be not the current uh, Atlas feature I ID. Um, and actually that's pretty much it. Um, the one other thing that I, I did uh, was to get the, the images to show, um, which I thought I would show as well. And there is a bit of magic here because you can imagine when I'm tr when I'm doing this on my desktop, the the path to this image is going to be something relative to my own uh, desktop system, and then when I publish it on the web, um, let's close some of those here. When I publish this map on the web here, this has to be a web, uh, you know, an image path on a on the website. So they're going to be different and the same when, the, when it renders the report. It's doing it on a server somewhere, not on my desktop. So these image paths need to kind of dynamically adapt to whatever um, context I'm currently using. Um, so I'm going to just open in my tech, oopsie, sorry, wrong thing. Um, so I'm going to copy that expression here, so as you can see, it's kind of big. But uh, so what I've done for these images, and they've all got the same expression, is I've told it to to use instead of a hard-coded path, I made an expression, um, which I'm just going to oh dear, I'm going to just copy to my text editor, which has got a nice big font set on it, so it's easy to read there, or hopefully easier. So basically, it it uses three. Um, kind of rules. The first thing it says, if it's in QGIS server context, then we set a project path. And what I've done is in my um, in my Nginx, um, which is the, the web server configuration, I've set this environment variable. You know what environment variables do, um, Amy? No. Okay, so on your, on any machine, Windows, Mac or Linux, if you go to like a terminal, I think you can say set something like that. And you'll see a whole bunch of like things that are set. They're just like keys and values, and mm. um, and those those are often used by applications to kind of control their state. So, for example, if you're using Postgres, you can set one called PG Pass, and you can put your password in there, and it will say, "What's your password?" Oh, let me go look in the environment variable, and we'll pick it up from there. So when we're running okay. the server, we can set these environment variables, and then QGIS has got this ENV um, expression. You can see it over here, uh, and that will basically go and look up that in, the value of that of an environment variable that you name. So you can just name anything. You can call it um, Bubble Debop or whatever, and uh, <laughs> and, you, and the Bubble Debop equals something, and then you can go look up what's your operating system reporting Bubble Debop as. Um, so what I did is have three things. First, it will look at the environment variable. If it's set, it will use that. I'm using this coalesce function, which basically says, keep trying the different um, expressions in the list here until one of them is not null. And then use the first one that's not null. So if this is not null, in other words, if it's been set on the operating system, then use that one. Um, and then the second one is that if you stored your project in uh, Postgres, can you remember I showed you how to use the project path, um, the project folder variable here? Yeah. For yeah, I do uh, when you're doing your your merge and projects, your mm -hmm. input project, right? But this won't work if your database, uh, you, if your project is stored in the database, because uh, um, like the database doesn't have a file system path, right? So you've got to 
you've got to come up with another way to get that yeah um, so um, so what I do is I, I first look at this project home option which is set here in QGIS so I just go to the um, project properties and you'll see that there's this general tab here and there's some things here that you can go and override so I set the project home to set it to to tell it this is where my project is stored on the disk um, and that way when Postgres is running and it's trying to work out what's my project folder um, it can it can skip over to this project home one and actually pick it up from there and then lastly if your project is saved as a qgs.qgs or qgz file on your disk um, then we can read it from the project folder um, and so all this does really is it constructs a path to the image which is context based um, uh, compared to like for example if you're in in input and in the field then it will pick up the project folder if you're on your desktop working in the database it will pick up the project home and if you're on the QGIS server and it doesn't know either of those things then it will pick it up from project path and that way then my pictures will work in all the different contexts without um, without issue so you, you'd almost want to like if you're setting up an input project and you're planning to use the same QGIS project on your desktop on uh, and, but uh, and Postgres and on the web, you'd almost do this as default for every image that, that you um, reference. Yeah, and that's it. And then um, the whole thing sort of all kind of um, hangs together very nicely because you don't really need other than writing a few expressions you're able to go to QGIS server and make it do, uh, you know, produce things without any programming really. I was just, uh, you know, writing this link into a field and um, I could potentially be putting everything in a field here and, uh, uh, you know, like making other complex um, interactions available without programming, which is kind of what I'm trying to do with this platform. Like I said, I'll give a more complete walkthrough at a, at a different time. Um, the idea is to build as much of a rich application as you can without actually uh, writing a lot of code. Um, and QGIS is really getting really good at, <laughs> at being able to do this. Um, yeah, anything that wasn't clear? No, it all seems pretty clear. There's a lot of... <laughs> QGIS magic that's gone on <laughs> in mm, this. Yeah. But I, I think it's a really cool tool, and I think it's great for people who don't have that coding background and aren't going to go and write reams and reams of code. If it's more of a point-and-click approach, then everyone can do it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Mm. Yeah. Mm. So that's all we have today. It's a short one, but uh, hopefully a good one. <laughs> and um, we'll catch you for the next one. Thanks for watching, everybody.